I'm standing with one of the most popular plants in the world, or at least a drink that we get from this plant is one of the most popular drinks in the world. So this is coffee. This is Coffea Arabica, and it's fruiting at the moment. So flowers are long gone. It's just starting to form its green fruit. And over the next couple of months, that fruit will ripen into a deep red color. It's often called a berry. Botanically, it's known as a droop. And of course, it's from that fruit that eventually we make the drink that um, most of us are probably addicted to. The plant itself comes from Ethiopia and also a place called the Buma Plateau in South Sudan. It's actually quite difficult for scientists to work out where wild plants are and which are the wild populations that still survive today in Africa, the continent from which the plant originates. We're also a little bit unsure about how long people have been using the fruit drying the beans and making the drink or a drink similar to what we know as coffee. There's lots of stories around, one in particular about an Ethiopian goat herder who noticed the goats being particularly lively after eating the red berries on the ground. Similarly, there's stories of Sufi mystics and Sufi leaders in Yemen noticing birds that seemed particularly lively that had feasted on the berries. What we do know though, Muslim scholars documented in Yemen that coffee was being made into a drink from about the 12th century. And it's from that part of the world that coffee really takes off as a drink. And the culture of coffee drinking, the culture of coffee houses, really becomes embedded as part of human culture, which then moves out across the world. So by 1605, coffee has moved to Venice. The Dutch are trading out of Yemen from a port appropriately named Mocha and they took coffee to the Dutch East Indies, what we now call Indonesia, by 1699. Coffee then spread through Europe. England became the place for coffee houses. It was introduced in the mid 17th century. So around the 1650s, the first coffee houses open up around the University City of Oxford. But by the middle part of the next century, so the mid part of the 1700s, there are 3,000 coffee houses in London. They're sometimes called the penny universities for the cost of a penny. You could get a coffee and sit all day and learn about the political trends of the day, stories from the scientific enlightenment, argue relentlessly about politics. Interestingly, wild coffee and coffee arabica is one of 120 species of the genus. There's even one genus that occurs in Northern Australia, Coffea bainesii. So there's a number of species, but it's really only Coffea arabica and Coffea canifora, which we commonly call robusta, that are cultivated on a massive commercial scale. So about 60% of the world's coffee is arabica, about 40% is robusta. Brazil is the world's largest coffee manufacturer, followed by Vietnam. Vietnam generally uses Robusta. So Coffea canifora, that the Robusta coffee comes from, is a larger plant. So Coffea arabica grows to about six to eight meters, Robusta 10 to 15 meters number of threats historically. So coffee rust, a fungal pathogen that affects the leaves of Coffea arabica, wiped out the coffee industry in Sri Lanka. Before Sri Lanka grew tea, it was known as Ceylon and it grew coffee. So coffee plantations were started by the British there, but it was wiped out by this fungal pathogen coffee rust. It wasn't until 1927 that a chance hybrid between Arabica and Robusta discovered on the island of Timor demonstrated resistance to coffee rust.
an incredibly important plant, a drink that we all love, but it also demonstrates the importance of preserving the wild populations of the species and the other 120 or so closely related species of Coffea arabica.